blessing us with your music. Thank you to all of our praise leaders today. Everyone for helping out. Ben, stepping out of your comfort zone and telling the story for us. Mitch, leading us as elder. Our AV team back there doing a great job. I uh, sure appreciate uh, everyone that comes together to make our worship service a blessing. And uh, appreciate our music leadership as well. Just bow your heads with me. Father, I just pray that you would anoint my lips, that you would anoint my tongue, or that you would saturate and baptize the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord, so that those with ears would hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. One of the uh, principles of public speaking, uh, and I may have shared this before, uh, forgive me if you've heard me say this, uh, but one of the principles of public speaking is to know your audience. And one of the uh, interesting dynamics that I have experienced here at Scottsdale Thunderbird is we have a very uh, changing audience on a regular basis here. Uh, and when we have home leave, I'm always, as I'm preparing my messages and I'm thinking about and praying about what God would have me say, I'm always trying to think about uh, what the composition of the congregation may be at the time uh, that I'm speaking. And I always kind of have this uh, uh, gut check, if I could put it that way, when I realize that because of home leave, uh, we're going to have such fewer uh, young people in church. I don't know if it's ever dawned on you, but, but when we have robust attendance from our dorm students and other teens, sometimes 30, 40, or even 50% of our congregation will be children or under the age of 18. Uh, and you talk differently to a group that's composed of that higher of a, uh, a percentage of young people. And by the way, this is very natural. Jesus talked differently to the Pharisees than he did to the Samaritans. He talked differently to the disciples uh, than he did to the crowds. Uh, and it's just a basic reality. Um, and I hope you don't interpret me as, as sharing this to say that I, uh, I like pull my punches or anything when the young people aren't here. Uh, but it just it does take a little bit more... Um, uh, analysis on my part, trying to predict uh, whether we've got just the regular old folk here or we have, <laughs> have the young people as well. Oh, but God is good, isn't he? I did not know that we had so many doctors in this church. I knew we had a few, but I did not know how many doctors we had. That it, it, that is a medical signature if ever I've seen one, and I I just am, am so impressed with that. Uh, here's another one. I appreciate people filling out these surveys and following what I I probably should have said please print your name. I think maybe because you know whenever you sign your credit card or anything, do you really practice that signature? I mean I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm just like whoop, you know and. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. That's kind of what I see here. If this is you, Elder Sheen, are you top scribble? Are you top scribble or bottom scribble? You're top scribble. Okay. Thank you. I don't know how you get Craig Sheen out of that, but uh, I could take that to a prescription probably, and it'll work just fine. Now, if you know who the bottom scribble is, or if you're the bottom scribble, would you just text me and say, that's me, Pastor. I, uh, 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 that's, that's my signature, because uh, I'd love to know as I'm uh, compiling the data uh, who it is we're talking about here. And so uh, help me out. And, and uh, I do appreciate, we, I've had a handful of those come in. I know some of you have told me, I've got it, I'm working on it, or even done it, haven't turned it in yet. I did put a deadline of December the 11th. Please don't wait until December 11th if you can avoid it. Um, that would be very helpful um, to our process of visioning and getting a report and a response out to you before the end of the year. That's my goal so that as we start 2022, we kind of have a coordinated, prioritized, energetic list of items that we as a church can begin to really focus in on and, and uh, make some progress in. And again, I, I, I know in the surveys I, I, I put on there, and I meant to take it out and edit it, it says for church members only, but I really am okay, and I encourage 
our visitors, especially if you're a regular visitor, you love our church, you want to see good things happen here, I really would love to have your feedback, young people, dorm kids um, as well. So I'm, I'm trying to keep this uh, um, as robust as possible. So just wanted to give that little reminder and um, thank you for owning up to the signature, Craig. <laughs> Nobody knows who this is? Okay, anyways, I'll make it up if I need to. All right, the title of my uh, sermon today is A Fair Exchange. When I was um, early on, and I, I can't remember if it was the summer of my junior year, um, I think it was the summer of my junior year, I, I got a job selling knives. Have, have you ever heard of Cutco? I sold Cutco. That was one of the things I did. And when you, uh, at least in my experience, they, they took us through a marketing uh, education process before they just sent us out. It was called Vector Marketing. And um, one of the principles, and this isn't like profound or anything, I just, I'd never really heard it stated this way, is that when you're selling something, you have to make sure that you let, and, and uh, when I was in school, things have changed so dramatically. The internet was just kind of becoming a thing um, when I was in school. Um, think about what is happening now with social media and everyone having access. Now, when I was in school, eighth grade, eighth grade is when I did the biology class where they told us about the birds and the bees and we all had to sit there looking like, please don't talk about this anymore. But I'm just telling you, in the early 90s, my teacher told me, you need to experience both heterosexual and homosexual relationships before you decide what you are. That was what we were told, okay? Uh, and you just think, after we've gone through so many generations of removing all boundaries to the biblical understanding of what our, our gender identity is, we've gone through a whole generation where the boundaries of sex itself have been removed. As long as you do it safe, and as long as you, uh, you know, it's consensual, no marriage isn't necessary, and commitment isn't necessary, it, it's fine, experience whatever you do in college. Then we had a generation where sexuality was also all boundaries removed. Whatever you do uh, in sexuality, whether it's, it's with the same sex or a different sex, uh, that's fine. And now we're in a new subset where even gender identity and sexual identity is now the boundaries of that are being challenged and disrupted. And you wonder why people are so confused. You wonder why it's so confusing. And the same with the sciences. Um, you, you have, uh, going back to the 1930s, taking God out of creation, taking God out of origins, you wonder why people today don't feel any sense of accountability or any sense of purpose. Because some of these challenges that um, have been faced uh, with, great, with greater vigor, and, and by the way, I can't speak to all public school experiences. Some of you may know or have uh, experiences that are uh, much more sane and, and uh, appropriate. Literature. Do you know what your kids are reading if they're in public school? Some of the books that I was, and I'm not just talking like the classics, like Catcher in the Rye and Tom Sawyer, and even those are kind of sketchy to some people, uh, Separate Piece, uh, Lord of the Flies. Um, but some of the assigned books that I had to read were not just a-religious, they were outright anti-Christian. And I'm not even going to give you the names. Because uh, for some of you, you're gonna, if I say you the name, you might want to rush out and learn more about it. Um, but I read one book, it was an assigned book, that it basically deconstructed and challenged uh, that Christianity was just a conspiracy. It was built on lies. It was concocted. Uh, in the, in a, and it was, it was a fiction book. Um, but we were expected to read that and discuss it and report on it. And the thing that, that struck me, and, and again, it's just a challenge. There was a pornographic section in that book. And the t this is a Bible. This is, not, this is a Bible. I'm using it as an illustration. Sorry, I don't, let me get something else. I don't even like doing that with a Bible. Would you hand me the hymnal underneath you there? Come on. Gracious. Okay. But the teacher, the teacher of that class, and by the way, decent guy, you know, he wasn't a hate-filled person, but he said, okay, everyone, we're reading this book, but you just need to know, don't read uh, anything between pages 362 and, and don't read it. Okay, now what do you think uh, 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 I was in the 11th grade, okay? What do you think a teenager is going to do? You take all of those books that had that, and you just set it on his, in, on his binding like this, and it would just flop open to that page. Okay, and uh, uh, again, highly violent, pornographic 
literature contained in a book designed to deconstruct and challenge the Christian faith explicitly and specifically in rural Yakima, conservative Washington. Literature is a big challenge. And we're not perfect in the Adventist church, guys. We're not perfect in any of these issues. We're dealing with sexting in our schools as well. Um, by the way, do you know what S&M is? If you have kids in school and you don't know what S&M is, you need to look it up. If you've never read the LGBTQ uh, da, 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 manifesto, it's out of England. You need to read it. You need to know what's going on. And again, we're not perfect. Uh, we're not perfect. But is it a fair exchange? That's, that's the, uh, the thing. Ethics and philosophy. Again, what happens when you remove the fear of the Lord from education? Now, even when uh, education in the public uh, setting uh, began to drift and prayer began to be eliminated in the Bible and creation and all that, there was still at least the, uh, you know, a shadow of the Judeo-Christian ethic in schools. And there still are Christian teachers. I went to the poll. You guys ever heard of go to the poll in, in February? Uh, it's in September. Meet you at the poll. Oh, yeah, that's a total public school thing. Oh, yeah, you, gotta, you know about that. It was a big deal when I was in school. It was a day when all Christians in school would meet at the flagpole before school, and, and they would pray together. Um, and I would be there with a handful of kids. We'd go, and sometimes my youth pastor would come. Every now and then a teacher would come until the teachers uh, was threatened to be fired. Teachers were threatened to be fired, even though they were doing it on their time outside of school hours. Um, so... Uh, but I would go to the poll and uh, get laughed at by the kids that walk by. But we would go, we would pray, and we would sing, and we'd try to say, hey, I'm a Christian. Um, but that, the vestiges or the, the, the remnants of the fear of the Lord are quickly departing from the public sphere. And uh, in the education setting, it is happening uh, at a greater, a, a greater rate. And um, again, I just think that our schools offer not just a hopeful alternative, but an essential alternative. History. Um, I remember I was having a debate with a friend of mine. He, he was not anti-Christian, but he was pretty irreligious. And we were arguing about Thanksgiving. We were arguing about a whole bunch of stuff. We always argued. That's why we were friends. Um, and uh, uh, he was trying to argue that, that there's no place for Christianity in, in society. There's no place for Christianity in schools. And I was saying, no, 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 a lot of our, I mean, look at our money. It says in God we trust. You know, I was using all those standard things. And the topic of Thanksgiving came up, and I said, hey, we've got a federal holiday that recognizes God and is thankful God. He said, oh, no, Thanksgiving has nothing to do with God. It's about thanking the Indians. They helped. They really bailed us out, those Indians. They brought all that food. Thanksgiving has nothing to do with God. It has only any, so we were going back and forth. Well, we decided, well, let's go talk to the authority. Let's go talk to a teacher. And so we went, I'm going to give you his name. His name was Mr. Green. We went and said, Mr. Green. And he was one of the history teachers. He taught some sciences and stuff either. Um, oh, I could tell you stories about Mr. Green. Whew. Anyways, um, oh, teachers, you, you guys make an impact on your kids. You know that, right? You, whew. Anyways, uh, Mr. Green, Mr. Green, settle this for us. Um, are, do we celebrate Thanksgiving to thank the Indians or to, uh, is it something religious, thanking God? And Mr. Green sat back in his chair and he pulled his arms across his chest and went, has nothing to do with God. It's only about thanking the Indians. Now, I was so shocked. You know, I thought, this is a guy should know. He's a teacher. That even I began to question my, my history. And I was like, ah. Not only did I lost the argument, and I was frustrated about that. Um, but um, I began to think, well, I must be wrong. By the way, this is all pre-internet, Jim. I couldn't just pull this out and go, oh, yeah, let me Google says. No, no. It wasn't there. I had to go to something called a library, Greta. A library has these things called books, okay, pages. I know this is kind of radical to you, okay? But I had to go to the library, and I had to look it up. Let me tell you guys, 1619, the settlers at Berkeley on the James River. This is two years before the pilgrims. We ordain that the day our ships arrived at the place assigned to the Planicon in the land of Virginia shall be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to who? Almighty God! In 1621, this is the pilgrims here, letter to Edward Winslow, and although it's not always been so plentiful as it was at time with us, yet by the goodness of who? God! We are so far from wanting that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. 
in, 60, or in 1863 when Abraham Lincoln designated the fourth Thursday of the month of November as a day of Thanksgiving, he said this, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, also those who are in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as what? A day of thanksgiving, a praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens, Oliver. Thanksgiving is about thanking God. Now, there was other, other expressions of thankfulness, but I had an, an authority figure in my life completely from their own political and, and emotional thing try to remove this historical reality from the holiday of Thanksgiving. And that was uh, of great concern and trial to me to have that happen. Again, it's not the same in every circumstance, but I think our schools are a fair exchange. I think the value we get out of them, the, play, the fact that you can come and pray. You know, with Bailey, who I've mentioned before, we love her teachers and we love her schools. And oftentimes, sometimes we'll pray before the parent-teacher meetings or the IEPs. But once we go onto the school property and the grounds, I don't know how it is where you work, Bambi, or um, Sarah, where you work. We're not allowed to pray. Oh, as a teacher, you can? Oh, you work at a Christian school, yeah. Um, and even some of our, the, the Christian teachers have said, yeah, we apologize, you know, if you guys want to pray, but we can't join in with that. That's weird. That's wrong. That's odd. It feels, it feels like we're missing something. And again, we're very thankful, very thankful for her, her staff and her teachers. But that reality alone is a challenge. I didn't mean to put this slide up when I did, but I did. There's another part of education that is a part of what we offer as a church that I think is also a fair exchange. I don't know what has happened over time. When I, when I grew up in the uh, Assembly of God Church, um, we went to church on Sundays, of course, but there was a saying, and I'm sure in Adventism there's a saying like this or in other churches, but we had a saying, if you love the church, you go to church Sunday morning. If you love the pastor, you go to church Sunday night. But if you love the Lord, you go to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. You ever heard something like that before? Never heard that before? Okay, Adventism could probably, you know, add its own little flavor or flair to that. But that was kind of this, this the, the, the cultural reality for many Christians, and not all to be sure. But really, church was not just a, a, a you know, a, a sermon. Church was an experience that spread out throughout the week. And along the lines, I don't know how it happened, but in Christianity, not just in Adventism and not just in this church, eventually the prayer meeting kind of lost its place. And it was really hard for churches to keep the prayer meeting or the Bible study going. Only a handful would come, and, and we, you know, you know the, the midweek prayer meeting kind of began to fade. And now Sabbath school, or Sunday school in many contexts, is kind of the next to go. And, and that's of concern to me because I still think Sabbath school is worth it. I still think Sabbath school is not just a, an optional thing for the, the super holy and those who like to get up early and have no responsibilities or anything like that. Um, Sabbath school has become a fading reality. And I don't know where, and again, I'm a pastor, so I, this is kind of a, uh, easy for me to stand up here and say, I've had those days where I'm tired or you know, be so nice to get out and have a walk or just watch from home. And I realize with virtual church and with online church and with home church, there's all these other things, options that people have. And if those are working in a robust manner, they can be quite powerful. I'm not convinced that those are totally sufficient in supplanting Sabbath school. But Sabbath school is also where we learn about the fear of the Lord. And I believe we do ourselves great jeopardy when we neglect opportunities to assemble and congregate to study God's Word together. I was hoping I'd get at least a whisper of an amen on that. Now, now here, I, I'm, 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 I'm making a withdrawal here from your graces. Um, I'm hoping I put in enough deposits, George, that I'm not going to go overdraft, okay? Um, Greta, that's a banking term. I don't know if kids today understand. I'm sorry to pick on you. I'm so sorry. Um, in our, and again, this isn't just for Scottsdale Thunderbird. This is something in my 20 years of pastoral ministry I've seen in dozens of churches and other denominations. A lot of churches are getting rid of Sunday school altogether. 
uh, they're not doing it at all. They just might do a combined thing during the worship service or, or something like that. Um, and some of those churches are, are, are growing and doing well uh, despite that fact. But I do wonder about what they're sacrificing in order to make that. A Sabbath school has become a fading reality. It is not unusual. As a matter of fact, I would say it's more usual here at Scottsdale Thunderbird, here at Scottsdale Thunderbird to have about a tenth of our attendance present in Sabbath school as at what we have for worship. Now, nobody look around at who I'm talking to. Okay? Now, again, I don't know if I would be a good pastor or a bad pastor if I was to ignore this, to be honest. When, when the Bible says in Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why does that not apply to Sabbath school? Is not Sabbath school a call of the church to assemble? Is it not? When did it become only when I have time, only if I feel like it? I, am I hurting you here today? I, I, I feel a burden for our people. And I realize our Sabbath schools, and again, not speaking specifically here, are not always the most energetic, engaging, radical, inspiring moments that you might be able to experience. But early on in my ministry, I adopted a principle. I call it the Mark Finley principle because I first heard it from Mark Finley. But when people would come to me and they'd say, and I've had this happen in this church. Uh, Pastor, I would come to Sabbath school if it was this, this, or that. If, if only we could discuss this, that, instead of this, and we could do that. And the, the Mark Finley principle is to go, great, when do you start? If you want it, lead it. Okay? If one of our Sabbath school classes is not your cup of tea and you really desire something unique, tell us about it and be part of the solution. I understand that we live in a consumer-driven society where we want to just come and be fed. We just want to come and have it provided. There's a time and place for that. There's a, a way in which we want to do that. But there's other things that we need people to rise to the challenge. You want more multimedia? You want more discussion? You want more roundtable? You want to look at topical things rather than the quarterly? Let's do it! We'll start next week. Will you be there? Will you be part of it? Sabbath school, friends, let me tell you a couple things. Um, I still believe that the study of God's word in some context, in some way, in an assembled arena, is essential to our faith, is essential to our fellowship, is essential to our children. It is essential to our community. What does it look like as a church when we have the doors open and the building empty when the visitors come in. What message does that send? Am I getting a little too real? Am I stepping on toes? Okay, because I'm here on an academy campus, this is very interesting to me. I mentioned that I went public school my whole life until college, and I didn't realize this. I'm 19 in college. I'm young. I'm dumb. I'm, I'm still learning what it means to be an adult, but I'm loving the freedom of adulthood, right? Loving to be an adult. I was at Walla Walla College, it was called college back then, um, that I learned about mandatory worship, which was so ironic to me because when I was studying to become a Seventh-day Adventist, one of the big things about Adventism is freedom of conscience, the right to worship as you want. Don't let anyone tell you that you have to worship on any day because God has said that the Sabbath is a day and it's up to you to do it, right? Loved it, right? And then I get to Walla Walla. Oh, except for chapels. You got to be there. You're required. And for me, now again, I didn't grow up in this. It was just like, what are you talking about? I have to be there. Now, I was married. I had a baby. I had responsibilities. And I thought, I need to go to work. Okay, I'm barely making it as it is. I have that time off. I need to go earn a few bucks so I can feed my family. So I don't know if this makes you like me or not as a pastor. But I, I wrote one of those letters, and I got an exception. I didn't go to chapel, Eva. I didn't go to chapel. Um, but... Um, it was interesting to me that there was this mandated worship. And again, I'm not here to say it's good or bad or, or anything, but I do wonder for our kids in academy who are required to go to Sabbath school. And for many of them, when they go to uh, college, if they're in the dorms, they have a variety of required worships they have to do. 
but the church across the road is empty. When they're required to be there, what do you think they're going to do when they're no longer required to be there? We don't have to guess. We know. We know. The vast majority of them will not stay in that context. Very interesting. I, I, I think that there's uh, more that could be discussed and, and said about that, but I find that interesting. Why do we find that it's an acceptable thing to require of our youth that which we ourselves are not doing? Do you think the kids don't understand that? Do you think the kids don't notice? I'm willing to bet they notice. What do we do about Sabbath school? You know, the Bible says that the time will come. The time will come when they will not endure. Notice that word he uses here. When they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, to some people, Sabbath school is an endurance sport. Paul says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they will, to satisfy their own tickling ears, assemble teachers who speak according to their own desires. And they will turn their aside from the truth and instead will turn towards myths. But you, be sober, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, Paul tells Timothy. Friends, I, I believe this. I believe this all my heart. I mentioned it to the board on, on uh, Thursday night. I believe the day is going to come when Seventh-day Adventists will long for the study of God's Word. When they will regret that they have not been among the assembly of God's people to break open the bread of life and study and grow in their faith. The day will come when the Spirit of God rests so heavily upon God's people that they will look back on those missed opportunities and they will weep. They will weep that they are not as grounded in God's Word and that they missed the essential opportunity to grow in their fellowship and faith that can only happen in Sabbath school. I believe that to my core. I believe that as the last days march down upon earth's history, the opportunities for God's people to meet in freedom, to meet in the house of God, will be reduced and eventually eliminated. And then God's people will cry out, where then can we gather? Where can we grow? Where can we meet? Is my faith sufficient for the days in which we live? Again, I believe with all my heart that there are great television programs that are feeding our faith. And there are online uh, engagement study times that are beautiful, wonderful opportunities. And there is in-home uh, op- you know, options and things that our people are doing. I am not ready yet to abandon Sabbath school and to declare that it is no longer a valid purpose for God's people in the last days. If ever we needed it more, we need it today. Now, for some of you, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I've been doing this a long time. We used to do occasional promotions of Sabbath school in, in churches, and, and like anything else, we would see, you know, we'd preach on it, and we'd give all kinds of uh, inspirational challenges and stuff, and we would see this uptick. Yeah, people would come for a while, but like anything else, look, I know how busy life is. I know how many pressures. I know how many burdens. I know how many things that are going on that distract and pull us away. I realize that. I'm just standing before you today as your pastor to say, I still think Sabbath school is worth it. I still think it's worth it. Can it be better? Absolutely. Could it be more engaging? Sure. Could it be more exciting? Of course. But it might require you to make it happen. It might require you to help. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe our schools are beautiful gifts that God has given us. I believe that our church and our ministries that we have, including Sabbath school, matter and that they are worth getting up early. I think they're worth driving to church. I think they're worth being here. And I'd love to have you 
include that in your plans as well. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to, you, said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth, and that they may teach their children. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. May God bless us as we all seek to understand and have that wisdom in our lives. Let me pray with you. God in heaven. Lord, I know that uh, your spirit is here with us. And Lord, I pray that I, if I've offended anyone by this, that they would be forgiving and generous and that we would be able to march forward together as a church and community. But God, I just pray that as time continues and as it seems as though we are witnessing additional indicators that the signs of the times are being fulfilled, that we would be all the more motivated to put our kids in an environment that fears you, to make it a priority to have our children and our youth in the best possible school that worships you and makes room for you in every aspect of education. And Lord, we do pray that you would bless all of our schools, including our private schools and public schools, we know, God, that you care deeply about every single individual. And Lord, give us wisdom as a church, as a family, about how best to move forward with Sabbath school. Lord, if there is something we need to change or something we need to do, make it clear to us, Father, and draw us together that this would be a foundational manifestation of your people in study. Thank you, dear God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you still love me? Thank you. We'll see you tonight at the game night. <laughs>